So in this chapter about liking and loving, or how romantic love uh, and partner formation happen, I want to emphasize a couple of key ideas um, that I think the text doesn't go into quite enough. And so one of them is the, idea, the concept of propinquity. So propinquity is the closeness that two people have. And I don't mean just an emotional closeness. Um, it, it's similar to proximity, right? Like geospatial closeness, uh, but also functional closeness, the likelihood that two people are going to interact or see each other or have structured reasons to be together. And propinquity, uh, without stating the obvious, uh, it, you know, it's one of the most predictive variables in whether two people will become uh, a kind of romantic pair. Uh, you know, if you don't know somebody exists, right, if, or if they live far, far away from you, the odds of you creating a sustainable relationship with them are much lower, right? Uh, now, when we talk about propinquity, let's keep in mind the functional closeness side, not just the proximity or geospatial closeness. Now, it is definitely handy if, say, your boyfriend or girlfriend or whomever, uh, your romantic attachment uh, is down the hall from you, right? Or maybe you live in the same building. Um, maybe you live in the same town, right? But the further the geospatial distance gets, the trickier it is to keep the relationship up because it takes more effort and planning to meet. But propinquity also includes that functional closeness. So how likely are you to see them? Now, they may be a whole town away, but if you go to the same church, or you're in the same class, or you have the same job and you work in the same office, right? Then you're going to see them all the time, even if they live a little bit further away, right? Now, somebody could work at your same company, but they're on a different floor than you. Uh, and even though the geospatial proximity is close, the functional proximity may not be, right? Somebody who's further away from you in the building uh, might actually have more propinquity with you if you go to the same uh, break room, or use the same elevator, right? Or if you're in an apartment complex, uh, somebody that might be a viable match for you could be closer in proximity than somebody else. But let's say that just the way the building is divided, the person whose apartment is only a couple doors down ends up using a different uh, you know, community pool or a different community elevator or mail room or something. Uh, and the person that's a little further, you, you end up uh, being assigned to the same you know, places where you're more likely to end up running into each other. So uh, propinquity is, is a variable that sometimes we don't think about because it seems obvious, like, oh, you need to have reasons to run into someone or you need to, you know, they can't be too far away from you. I mean, we know that long distance relationships can work, but they're very difficult. They take much more energy to sustain than ones where people are closer, both in geospatial distance or proximity and in functional uh, closeness, the likelihood that they're going to continue seeing each other. Um, so propin propinquity is a huge variable. Now, you know that there's a variety of other variables, right? We could talk about physical attraction. We could talk about uh, similarities, reciprocity, right? Do they like you back? We tend to be more attracted to people that are also attracted to us, right? Otherwise, that'd be a, a bummer if everyone you liked didn't like you back. Um, there's... Uh, you know, or do you match up in similar ways on, on, you know, compatibility features in your lifestyles or your values? Uh, do you want both want the same, you know, kinds of kids or lifestyle? There, there's a lot of variables that we could could look at. But one theory that I think helps uh, make sense of a lot of that is exchange theory. Now, exchange theory is this concept that uh, every social interaction to some degree is a negotiated exchange of some kind of good or service. Now, when we're talking about romantic markets and partner formation, those goods and services, you know, they could be money, <laughs> but uh, likely there are a variety of these other variables we're talking about. You know, if you see two people uh, that are in a partnership um, and one of them's much more attractive than the other, an exchange theorist would say, okay, there's a little bit of mismatch there but it might be balanced out by something else in the exchange. Maybe that person um, is just, you know, maybe they're very wealthy, right? And, the, and so, or high in status because of their career. And so that's why they've paired up. Um, or maybe they're just very funny or very kind. Uh, but for some reason, this partner views them uh, as, the, you know, even though one of them is more attractive than the other, the other has some other way that, to offset that difference because they have some other value that they're giving in the exchange. Uh, I think it's a, you know, it, on one hand, you can critique exchange theory as somewhat unromantic, 
right? It's like, well, people just fall in love and they don't really know why. There's just chemistry and attraction and connection. And, uh, and exchange theorists would say, well, that, that's true, but very likely uh, there is more going on under the surface, right? So yes, you might simply be attracted to someone physically, but you don't always fall in love with people you're attracted to. You don't always create partner formation, you know, with people that you're simply attracted to. So that's only one variable in the exchange, right? Uh, how similar are you in socioeconomic status, education, age, uh, you know, because if you're far apart on those variables, then there's something in the exchange that probably has to balance out somewhere else. It's also interesting to think about social exchange theory in terms of uh, the endurance uh, of a relationship over time, because people change, right? So the person who is much more attractive at the beginning, well, over the years, they might, you know, their, their looks might fade a bit. Uh, but what if the other person who has a high status and wealth only continues to get more status and wealth, right? So that exchange would start to become mismatched. Uh, or, you know, somebody is considerably older than the other one, but they're funny and kind. And so the, the exchange balanced. But now as they continue to get older, the, the older one uh, starts having serious health problems, right? And so the exchange is now, again, mismatched. Now, certainly there's, you know, concepts of commitment uh, and sort of like loyalty and being with someone through thick and thin and, you know, good times and bad times. And that's a choice people can make. Uh, but exchange theorists would say that a relationship is stronger, healthier, and more easily, you know, propped up and together when there is a balance in the exchange, when you feel like you're really getting a good deal for what you're putting in, right? If you feel like you're the only one who has to help uh, to apologize or, you know, whenever that you guys disagree or have a fight, right, that's going to start to feel heavy, right? Or, or maybe you're different religions and that's not a big deal in the beginning, but then later in life, one of you gets much more religious or you're the same religion, but then later in life, someone switches religions or deconverts out of the religion. Well, now that changes the exchange equation a little bit, right? And so uh, it's one thing to talk about exchange theory in initial partner formation, but it's also helpful to think about, you know, over time, is the exchange rate you know, still worth it for both of these people? Uh, because people change. You, they get laid off. They gain and lose weight. They, you, you have kids. Those kids go away to college and move out. You know, So as life evolves, that bundle of goods and services that the two partners are sharing or exchanging back and forth may vary. And so it would, you know, a couple would do well, an individual partner in that couple would do well over time to think, you know, just because I'm married now, uh, that means we're locked in for life. Now, an exchange theorist would say, doesn't matter what stage you're in, you should always think about, uh, are you offering a good deal right, for what the, the other partner is giving you? Because if you're receiving a much better deal in the relationship than they are, there's a much higher chance that relationship will falter. Um, so over time, be thinking about, you know, how can I continue to give a better deal, a better exchange to my partner? And likewise, you know, hopefully they are thinking in the same way uh, back to you. Now, psychologists will study different aspects as well. You know, you've probably heard of love languages or attachment styles. So there's a variety of theories you can look at. But I wanted to emphasize these two that I think are really powerful. Propinquity, you know, physical proximity plus functional closeness and exchange theory. You know, those two concepts alone, I think, are super highly predictive uh, in helping understand why certain people form a relationship and then why those relationships do or do not endure over time.